If you give a dad a donut, he'll want a cup of coffee to go with it. He'll get a mug out of the cupboard. Opening the cupboard will remind him that he needs to replace the hinges. He'll go to the garage for a screwdriver. Well, my dad's in the garage. He'll remember that the car needs an oil change. After he takes the kids to soccer and ballet practice, he'll stop at the store to buy hinges and oil. While he's there, he'll see the new power tools. Seeing the power tools will remind him of all the projects he has to do at home. So he'll buy some tools. On his way home, he'll pick up the kids, grab dinner, and go to the store for milk. After dinner, Mom will bring out donuts for dessert. Chances are Dad will already be asleep in the recliner. Hey, welcome to our online service today. My name is Pastor Steve, and this is Mario Flores, our church planting resident. Happy Father's Day, Mario. Thank you so much, and happy Father's Day to all the fathers joining us this morning. Hey, we are so glad that you joined us. This is our first day that we're doing in-person services. A couple different ways that you can join us today, of course, here online. If you come to our campus, there's two services in person in the South Campus in our sanctuary, 9 and 1030. And then also at 9 and 1030, we have our North Campus watch parties. Uh, join us if you can. Yeah, and also thank you so much for joining us last weekend for our drive-in service. It was a great success. We're so excited to see you last week, and we're also excited to worship with you this morning as well. Yeah, so thank you for those of you who participated in that uh, drive-in service. Check out this recap from last week. Well, today we continue giving to the Pentecost offering, this goal that we have from the church plant team to raise $100,000 to fuel the church planting movement. Number of different ways that you can give. You can send your checks into the, the office or you can give online. But yeah, thank you for your generosity for that. And thank you so much for giving to the kingdom. And now we turn it over to the band.
Happy Father's Day, everyone. We're so glad that you're a part of this body of believers. In all this chaos and turmoil and madness that we see all around us lately, this is so needed, I think. It's refreshing to the soul. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. We tend to think of that in evangelical terms, but that light is good for believers, too. We can become lost in the darkness, disoriented and unable to see clearly. There's a term called gaslighting. It's derived from a play called Gaslight, which also became a movie in 1944 starring Ingrid Bergman. And in the story, this devious husband is trying to get his wife committed to a mental institute. And so he psychologically manipulates her in different ways. And one of the things he does is he slowly, gradually dims the lights in their house. And when she notices the lighting change, he pretends like he doesn't know what she's talking about. Messing with her head, her mind, and trying to get her to lose her grasp on reality. Well, our world is against us. We have an enemy and he wants to dim our lights, to mess with our minds, and to get us to question reality. So we're in a series that is meant to point us to Christ as the truth to affirm that Jesus is the truth, and to embrace God's word as the only standard for objective reality. And I want to start today with a passage from the book of Psalms, Psalm 139, 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord? and abhor those who are in rebellion against you. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. How do we know the truth? How do we discover what's true? We do have certain tools at our disposal to discover truths. A science might come to mind. The scientific method is a wonderful and effective process for learning about the natural world. It's revealed a lot of true things about our universe and our world. We have a greater understanding of our reality because of science. Now, some people go a bit extreme with it. People even argue that science is the only means for discovering truth. Uh, That is what is known as scientism. Uh, But the problem with this particular perspective of scientism is that it's completely self-refuting. The proposition refutes itself. You understand what I mean by that? If you're not tracking, um, this might help click. Here's a couple of self-refuting statements. I do not exist. The statement refutes itself. Uh, Or how about this? No English sentence is ever longer than three words. The statement refutes itself. Scientism in this way is self-refuting because scientism is not scientific. The statement is, science is the only means to discover truth. That is a truth claim, but it's not a scientific one, it's a philosophical one. So if the claim is true, then scientism is false, it's self-refuting. Or think of it this way, if we took that claim as our scientific hypothesis, science is the only means to discover truth, that's our hypothesis, What scientific tests could possibly be conducted that would prove that? What experiment could we possibly run that would demonstrate that? We can't take that claim and measure it or weigh it or look at it under a microscope or view it from a telescope or dissect it or break it down chemically. No, it is a philosophical claim that falls out of the purview of science. Science is a great tool for discovery but it's limited in its scope. And increasingly in our world, it seems less and less reliable. Now, how can I say that? I mean, how can science be less reliable? Science is just a methodology. How can that be less reliable? Well, what I mean is for it to function properly, it requires integrity. And there's the problem. 
integrity. Just in recent days, we, we've seen numerous examples of members of the scientific community violating any sort of principles of science. With all these stringent social distancing guidelines, over a thousand health experts signed a petition in support of the continued protests. Because apparently the virus ceases to be communicable or transmittable if it's in the presence of a good cause. Does that sound like science to anyone? Or we saw a medical journals, The Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine published a study on dangers of hydroxychloroquine, which is a drug that we thought would help combat COVID. Because of that study, the World Health Organization and other government health agencies stopped trials and testing on hydroxychloroquine. But now it turns out that that data in the study was falsified. Now, you could say that's just the process working. That's what peer review is there for. It's to ensure the integrity of the research. But what does or doesn't get published for peer review or in these science journals is an editorial decision. Human beings with their biases, their prejudices, their worldview, their bends, their motives. Humans decide what research gets published and what research doesn't. People have lost their jobs for publishing scientific research that runs contrary to the general ideology of the science community. That's happened. See, our motives, our ideology, our beliefs can shape our science rather than the other way around. We see this all the time. If we discovered a, a single-celled organism on Mars, every single science journal and every single newspaper, for that matter, would, in big, bold font, declare life found on Mars. But those same people, when it comes to multicellular organisms in a womb, well, that's not life. It's just a clump of cells. That's not life, or at least not important life, which, by the way, is not a scientific claim. So science as a tool for pointing us to truth has some serious deficiencies. What else we got? Logic, reason, rational thought, philosophy. Oh, these are tools for us to uh, identify truth. Not seeing a lot of that in our culture though lately. I read an article that was explaining why we are not persuaded by facts. And it seems that that is the case. I look around and I don't see people who are interested in facts or data or reason. Our culture is perfectly comfortable with contradictory and incoherent positions. I love this quote from G.K. Chesterton. We shall soon be in a world in which a man may be howled down for saying that two and two make four in which people will persecute the heresy of calling a triangle a three-sided figure and hang a man for maddening a mob with the news that grass is green. Boy, he got that right. Well, I saw this recently. Speech is violence. Okay, that doesn't seem to be in agreement with what words mean, but okay. But then I saw this. Silence is violence. So speech is violence, but also silence is violence. The only thing that doesn't seem to be violence is violence. I saw this article pop up. This made me laugh. This is in the UK. 27 police officers injured during largely peaceful anti-racism protests. So speech is violence. Silence is violence. Violence is largely peaceful. We are a culture that is not interested in logic or internal consistency. We don't care about facts or data or reason. What we feel is the truth. But here's what God's word says. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Proverbs 14 verse 12. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. John 3.19 says, People loved darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Jesus says in Mark chapter 7, verse 21, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder. 
Paul says this in Ephesians, So I tell you this and insist on and the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. If you're looking inwardly for the truth, you're not going to find it. Our hearts are hardened. The heart is deceitful above all else. It seems right, but it leads to death. If you want truth, you won't find it by staring at yourself in a mirror. We find truth by looking to Christ. James says this, James chapter 1, verse 25, But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. If we want truth, we look to God and His Word. You know, none of our tools for finding truth work apart from that. A hardened heart won't listen to reason or logic. A darkened heart won't apply the scientific method with integrity. Any truth we've ever gleaned has only come either from the common or special grace of God. Romans says this, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And that's not limited to people outside the church. In 2 Timothy, Paul says this, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Oh, we see that painfully in our own denomination. Rejection of sound doctrine. People who would rather be on the right side of history than the right side of God. Who are more moved and motivated by slogans than the words of God. You know, there's a line in a Jack Johnson song that says, Caught up in all the trends. Well, the truth began to bend, and the next thing you know, man, there just ain't no truth left at all. So what do we do? Well, it's Father's Day, so listen to these words from Paul to Timothy. These are words from a spiritual father to his spiritual son. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, oh, Oh, the world's going to say this. The world's going to do this. The world's going to think this. But as for you, as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Deuteronomy says this, chapter 11, verse 18, Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds, tie them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. How are we doing in that? Are we living our lives dedicated to the words of truth? Are we living our lives in ways that point us to Jesus? to the way and the truth and the life? Are we raising our kids in that? You know, I can look around at the world and just be so depressed about the state of things and just be overwhelmed by it that it's so devoid of truth. And it is. But as for you, as for you, if we want the world to have truth, it needs to start with us. It needs to start in our homes. Now that's great for us, but how do we reach others with the truth? How do we reach people who won't be persuaded by facts or reason? How do we reach people whose hearts are hardened and dark? We love them. We love them. That's the answer. That's what the words of truth say. Love them. And not in the empty sort of love that is 
all too common these days, this sort of patronizing love, acquiescing love, virtue signaling love. You know, that's not new either. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. Empty virtue signaling. Look how much I love. Look how much I care. I'm one of the good ones. Just change your profile pic, and you too can be virtuous. It's not wrong to support causes on social media, just as like it's not wrong to give to the needy. No, this is a heart issue. But I am increasingly convinced that when we stand before God in judgment, a common refrain we will hear is, you got your likes, you got your retweets, that's your reward in full. No, the love that God calls us to is so much greater he calls us to love even our enemies. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Paul says this in Romans. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It's easy to hate. I look around at everything that's going on, and I find it really easy to hate. It's hard not to when you see videos of evil, police brutality, rioting and looting, lawlessness and slander, and politicians posing for photo ops. And that can fill you with rage. And there is a holy indignation. There is a righteous anger. But so often it becomes twisted. James says this, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Ephesians says this, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Let's turn back to where we started, to a Psalm of David, Psalm 139, 19. If only you, God, would slay the wicked, Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty, they speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. O oh, David has anger and rage, and these are evil people doing evil things, and he hates, and you can hear a pause. Wait a minute. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Maybe this isn't righteous anger. So he holds it up to God for truth because his heart can deceive him. And that's what we need to do. Hold it up for God, for truth. Oh, well, the world says, take that rage, stoke it, inflame it, permit it, justify it, excuse it. But the words of truth say, get rid of it. The world says, hate those who hate you. Repay evil with evil. But the words of truth say, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Martin Luther King Jr., Echoing those words in Romans said, Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that is a truth that has spoken to us for centuries. In Les Mis, that old story, Jean Valjean is a convict that has been treated poorly by the justice system. And he winds up stealing from a bishop. And that bishop responds to him with mercy and grace. He gives him what he stole, plus a little more. And in the musical, we have Jean Valjean's soliloquy where he says, Yet why did I allow this man to touch my soul and teach me love? He treated me like any other. He gave me his trust. He called me brother. My life, he claims, for God above, can such things be? For I had come to hate the world, this world that always hated me.
transformed by love that still resonates even in our darkened hearts. So how do we do this? How do we love our enemies? How can we possibly? I don't know, but I'm sure that it starts by looking to Christ. You know, whatever injustices we may have suffered, and it may be a lot, Christ endured more and deserved it far less. And if you want to know where you stand in history, and the only history that matters, we are all on the wrong side. It was our unjust acts that put him on the cross. It was our brutality that whipped him, our fists that beat him, our mouths that spit on him, our voices that mocked him. And as Jesus is suffering this injustice, as he's enduring the wrath of God for our sins, as he's hanging on a cross, he strains for breath to say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Loving your enemy is not some high ideal. No, it's the truth of the gospel itself. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we come before you humble, just taken back by your love, that while we were enemies, you loved us and died for us, that you took away our sins to establish a ministry of reconciliation. Lord, help us to be faithful ministers of that mission. Help us to love our neighbors. Help us to love our enemies. In your name I pray. Amen.
Thanks for joining us today. Now receive a blessing. As you go into this week, would you go in the Lord's power and in his peace and, and love well, love even your enemies. Amen.